War is weird, or at least our experience with it. It's nothing like you imagine, but at the same time, it's everything you imagine and worse. I have served in some rough places before, but if you had told me a year ago that I would be a part of moving goods and people and medical supplies through Ukraine during an active war, I probably would have laughed in your face. First of all, we have never had an interest in Ukraine or any of Eastern Europe for that matter. Secondly, we certainly have no interest in war or politics. But God is funny and his plans are way different than our own. We were exploring Finland when war broke out to the south. We weren't sure what we could do or if we should even do anything. But we were in the area and we certainly had nothing more important to do, so we signed on. I'm not sure what all I expected. I know I expected to hug and feed refugees, I expected to love on babies and comfort teen members. I expected an extended stay. I knew there would be hard moments hard days. If I've learned anything from missions over the last 13 years, it's that there are days of glorious purpose, days of monotony, and days of outright attack where everything and everyone grates on your nerves. What I didn't expect or know how to anticipate was the nature of war itself. Our experience with war was one complicated and tangled web of confusion. Nothing in our life previously could have prepared us, yet, though we surely made mistakes, we somehow felt capable. Every person who's had contact with this war has their own experiences, their own interpretation. Some of these stories are hard to tell. We bore witness to the greatest heroic feats of humanity, its triumphing moments of love and compassion, but we've also seen the depths of its depravity. The situation in Ukraine is complex, historically, politically, socially, and as outsiders there's no way for us to fully understand that tangled web. We've had some time now to process our experiences and we'll attempt to share our stories and pertinent revelations with you. Just know that we're still working through it and these experiences are just the interpretation of two volunteers, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Yeah. I'm nervous. Nervous? Yeah. You're nervous. I don't know. Seems like a nervous topic. Oh, yeah. I'm nervous. I have M&M's. That'll be better. <laughs> you do have M&M's and pretzels and coffee. So yeah. That'll help. Yeah. Got snacks. Got coffee. Got us. That's yep. all we need. Good evening guys, I'm Abby, this is Ryan, you are watching Lost Among Locals, and we have landed in the cutie patootie <laughs> little town of Hot Springs, Arkansas, which, if you guys don't know, if you haven't watched our early videos, Ryan and I hail from Arkansas, it is our home, um, and Hot Springs is probably our favorite place in the state. I think so. It's, we've, we've been here quite a bit. So yeah, it's yeah. got fabulous restaurants, a really cool old history, mm -hmm. um, both Native American and like bathhouse 1920s. Casino gangster <laughs> prohibition history. Um, so yeah. yeah, so there's some really cool stuff here. We've landed here this weekend to visit Ryan's family for our Thanksmas. Thanksmas <laughs> holiday. Yeah. Thanksmas holiday. Yeah. Um, his family's kind of spread out all over the state, so this is like our middle meeting ground. We get together, kind of in between, to do all of our Christmas stuff. So. Yeah. So we came up at night early. Um, just booked us a basic hotel room. Nothing. Nothing here to show you. Mm -hmm. Little Hilton <laughs> rewards points and whatever. Um, however, if you come to Hot Springs, we don't recommend you stay here. We recommend no. you stay in one of the incredible boutique hotels they oh. have here. Um, they have lovely bed and breakfast. They've even turned some of the old bathhouses into hotels. Really, really lovely yes. places to stay, but we were being cheap. So, um, but we thought, since we had this plushy chair and a little bit of time until mm -hmm. we meet family later on, that we would go ahead and get this Ukraine business out of the way. Yeah. So I'll be perfectly honest with you. I've been putting off filming this video for a really long time. And it's solely because, well, it's a lot of reasons. Yeah. It's hard. It's really hard. It's, um, it's hard to know how much to get into, 
how graphic to get. Yeah. Um, what, it's hard to know. I mean, what all you can actually say about with it yeah. compromising people that are there. It's um, really personal. Yes. So it's a little vulnerable. Mm -hmm. um, so that's just your forewarning. Yeah. This could get ugly. <laughs> we could ugly cry on you. And if we do, we're sorry. Um, yeah. And if we giggle or laugh, then just know that it is probably out of nerves or sometimes in these sort of situations you have to laugh or you'll cry and um, not just when you're f not just filming this but even in the situation you get that sort of dark humor ER nurses know this and docs like you get like a dark humor because that's the only way to survive um, so there may be stories that we tell that we giggle through a little bit because mm. that's how we made it through yeah. um, was to laugh and so just know if our emotions seem off to you we're not psychopaths <laughs> yeah <laughs> we don't not like we don't have feelings it's just it, it, we're not psychos yeah. but we're just trying to keep it together yeah. so if you're lost on what we're even talking about in march yes i think it was march yes early march obviously russia invaded ukraine mm -hmm. ryan and i were in finland when it happened um with plans to travel all of eastern europe last year um we very quickly realized that there was you know probably something that we needed to do and long story short which we'll get to those details later but um we ended up spending nine weeks eight or nine weeks i think so that sounds right in Ukraine, mm -hmm. serving with a crisis relief company last year during the months of March and April and into May. And so this is, we've had a lot of questions from you guys, both in person and online about what it was like. And, and, um, and we have been able to tell some of those stories in a private group, but just know as we present this, you know, that our brothers and sisters there are still fighting every single day. And, um, you know, there are a lot of things that we can't show you. There's a lot of things that we can't tell you yeah. because we can't compromise who they are, what they're doing, mm -hmm. the rings they're running in, where they're located. Mm -hmm. We just can't. Um, so we'll probably leave out a lot of names. <laughs> yeah. And you'll just get stories. Um, war is not what it used to be now. It's all digital. They're tracking your mm -hmm. phones. They're watching people. They're watching what people post online and on social media and like, all kinds of stuff to find these people who are, you know, in resistance against them. So you just got to be careful. So we're just going to start with answering your questions. Um, and we'll stick in some stories on our way too. Sound good? Sounds good. All right. So the first question is from Instagram. It's from Smoko's Lens. And it says, how did you decide to visit? <laughs> and we got this question in a lot of different formats uh -huh. but basically people are just asking like how does that even happen like how do two travelers like <laughs> youtube video makers end, end up, up in randomly ukraine. in an active war yeah. zone in ukraine <laughs> um well yeah <laughs> <laughs> good question good question that's a good question um well we've done missions quite a bit and so we're not opposed to going into rough places. Right. And so we actually, Abby's mom worked for a company and she randomly actually messaged us saying, hey, <laughs> yeah. they're like, we're going to help out if you want to check in and see if that's something you want to align with. And we were leaving Finland. Yeah. We were just in been Estonia. goofing yeah. off in Finland, you know, dog sledding. And if you haven't seen those videos, you can go watch those. But um, I get this text from, we're coming into Estonia bombs had just dropped the first ones like the day or two before mm -hmm. and um we were already talking about we're all, we're here like what does that look like um for most of our adult life we've spent um several weeks during the summer four or five weeks in the summer on mission somewhere in nepal or haiti or an extended mission mm -hmm. um and then a lot of shorter ones in africa india and places like that um i'm technically a nurse by trade that is what i am by education um i don't do it anymore but I do still have a license. Um, we both have English as a second language certificates and Ryan's a teacher, obviously, so we've served in a lot of different capacities um, in the, since, gosh, 2008 or nine, probably uh, we've been yeah, doing that's that. that's probably about that. So mm -hmm. um, it wasn't like a totally foreign concept to us. Um, 
but we're on the ferry on the way over into Estonia and I get this text from my mom and it's like, oh, by the way, <laughs> uh, Christ deploying to Ukraine and it looks like they're going to be there for a long time. So we hole up in a hostel in Estonia in Tallinn and we begin to think about it and pray about it and we just decided to contact them. I spoke with the leader and we decided to do the training with them. We did have to go through like a week long mm -hmm. training of crisis intervention stuff. Everything from first aid to yeah. like counseling and, counseling and for all, trauma. a lot yeah, of all different stuff. kinds yeah. of things yeah. that we powered through in, <laughs> yeah. in a week to get done. And um, and we decided to go. We would meet them in Poland the next week. So that's why our Estonian video was so short. We were. Uh -huh just getting that done and um, and so we went in on a short-term basis like we're gonna try this out for a week or two see if this company is a good fit for us see if there's yeah. anything for us to do that we're you know being used well and um, and just just see where it leads mm -hmm. and it ended up leading to us being there and a kind of a team leader role for about 10 weeks or so yeah. something like that mm -hmm. um, so that's how we got there. <laughs> it was, um, as I said in the intro, if you would have told me a year ago that I would be moving people and goods and food and through an active war zone in Ukraine, I probably would have laughed at you yeah. because that was not on my radar. <laughs> no. But um, that's where we ended uh -huh. up. <laughs> All right, next question. The next question is from the Vandersons, also from Instagram or YouTube. If you guys haven't seen their channel, they are van lifers who have a doggy, Sambrita, and a cat, Graham. Mm -hmm. They have a van cat. Um, and he's like a hiking cat. Oh, yeah. Graham's pretty awesome. Graham's but pretty anyway, awesome. we met them in Mexico quite some time ago, and they are working their way all the way down through South America. Yeah. They're there now. Like, they're, they've are they made the journey. Uh -huh. So, anyway, they're super fun to watch. Really nice people. Um, but their question was, how did you do the, the very basic stuff? Like, did you stay in a hotel or did you stay with locals? Like how in the world does that stuff get done? <laughs> That's kind of a complicated question. Too. That is a complicated question, yeah. but that was basically a lot of what my job was, was logistics. Um, like we said, we were under another team leader when we first got there and we were actually in Poland. Our first station was in a very small town on the southern border of Poland. Um, all of the main, like the two northern and the Lviv entrance to Ukraine um, were nightmares. That's where most of the foreign aid was coming in. That's where most of the refugees were getting out. And those border crossings were horrendous. So we stationed ourselves outside of the southernmost border crossing in a really small town. Mm -hmm. And the first place that we stayed was actually a man who owned a chalet there in a little ski village yeah. and he a local church set us up with him and we stayed in his place for a week or two with our first couple of teams that was set up before we got there really and then from there um, Poland was in a really good place like they had plenty of volunteers we started out at the border every day mm -hmm. but it was just it was the the, the foreign aid that was yeah there it was, was phenomenal I mean yeah and it was more than they needed, really. Oh, yeah, really. food, clothing, medical, I mean, medical, just everything. refugee centers stacked to the brim, yeah. just waiting on people that weren't coming, you know? So... <coughs> Hachim <Hachimimu. sighs> Okay. Good? Yeah. Um, so we decided as a team that we needed to get in further. And so we moved further into a town south of Lviv, um, and from there we were met with another couple of really great contacts mm -hmm. and in Ukraine especially the time that we were there it's really just like who knows who that knows who that knows who that <laughs> might have something that does this yeah. um, or that so you really are working if we hadn't had help from locals there's absolutely no way and it's that way on most missions uh -huh. but this for 125 percent we would have gotten absolutely nothing done without the help of some incredible local yeah. people and we'll tell you more about them but um, basically, the people that we knew in Poland knew a couple of guys in Ukraine, one a pastor and a teacher. And so our second set setup was actually in an upper room of a 
fitness center. Fitness center, yeah. So it was a fitness center all day long, and then they mm. locked the doors, and we came in, and we slept in the upper room that had this little baby, baby tiny kitchen uh-huh. with our teams every night. We were um, like in the yoga blow up mattresses, council, yeah, like in like the yoga room. room. We just had a bunch of air mattresses, yeah. Yeah, so air mattresses and a yoga room, and that was like our second um, phase of the game. And then um, when it came time to move even closer and move into Kiev, um, at that point, um, a new a new deployment leader had come yeah. in, um, mm-hmm. and we had made some connections. Technically, a youth ministry, um, but they have campuses all over the world. Yeah. They do amazing work everywhere in the world, um, and we were able to partner with them, and then also have some splinter teams with a local who lived in Kiev. Mm-hmm. Um, so some of us were staying in an apartment in Kiev, and yeah, so we had a few different places that we stayed, but it was all locally done and um aside from me booking like hostels for our teams to stay in as Uh they were coming and going otherwise it was all like who knows somebody that knows somebody that has an apartment that might rent it to us you know um and so yeah that's that's kind of how that went down yeah no way you could have done it without no no without the locals no Yeah. yeah yeah and i guess this is probably a good time to talk about that um this might be where I get teary on you. <laughs> um, we were a hundred percent blown away by just the concerted effort of international teams coming from all over the place. But also, you know, we land and our our partner. We had a guy out of Florida, Oleg, who came and he spoke Ukrainian and Russian and um, was kind of a logistics master and turned out to be a very good friend to us. Mm-hmm. We would have made it through without Oleg. Yeah. He, he probably did more work than we did, oh honestly. Like yeah. he, was, he turned into our right-hand man, but honestly, he did more than, <laughs> yeah. than us. Um, and I landed, and then he went to this meeting and landed, and it was so funny because it was like a businesswoman, a school teacher. A pastor's wife, Mm -hmm. a pastor, and, like, a couple of young kids, really. And these people, you know, had... Their whole worlds have been devastated. Their families have been moved out to different countries, and they couldn't get out for whatever reason or didn't want to. Um, And they just became, like, underground war brokers. (laughs) So, you know, so it was so funny because just like us, you know, we're here doing things that Mm -hmm. we have no clue... How we got here, we're just willing to do it. And and then you look around, and it's a whole team of people who are just pulling whatever connections they have, calling whoever they know, getting whatever they can, figuring out, using, you know, their old businesses to leverage trucking companies to move this or that. And and, um, and they basically became war brokers. Yeah. You know? and, um, and we somehow just, bloop, <laughs> right into that fold. Um and every day, we all just looked at each other like, well, not sure how we're going to do that, but we'll figure it out. And sure enough, you know, by the end of the day, you did. So it was just this funny, like, spider network uh-huh. of, and everybody we met along the way, it was like, well, you know, who are you? What do you do? And she'd be like, well, I'm a housewife or I'm mm-hmm. a whatever, but right now I'm doing this. And it was just incredible. Like, yeah, incredible, incredible people. So... Um, the next question is from Emily and Danny, and they said, and we get this question a lot too in a lot of different forms, um, but basically, did you feel like you were in danger? I would say no. There was there were times, yeah. at maybe at first, mm-hmm. there we weren't really used to the situation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But maybe one time I did feel like I was in danger. Yeah. I would say in the moment... And this is one of those weird things that's mm-hmm. hard to explain if you're not in it. You just don't have time for that. Yeah. You just, don't, like, especially with, I don't want to make it sound like I was carrying a huge burden. Um, but I was busy all yeah. day, every day, organizing transit, organizing what the teams were going to do for the day, making sure everybody had food and water and um, you're answering questions. We were getting new teams constantly, so we were constantly taking this trip that was 10 hours 
from Kyiv into Krakow, Poland, which was the closest airport that was open. And then we were making extra trips in between mm -hmm. to pick up baggage and cargo. And we were trying to buy vehicles in yeah. between the mix. And so we were constantly having to drive to this city to register a vehicle or drive to that city to like pick up something or go to this yeah, city. And it was, so it was just mm -hmm. constant yeah. motion. And you didn't have time to think about that. Yeah. Um, and I think also, if you had spent your, if you let yourself go there, you wouldn't have been functional. So nobody let their self go there. Yeah. yeah. Um, if you would have asked me when I first came out of Ukraine if I ever felt in danger, I would have unequivocally said no. I felt mm -hmm. safe the whole time. As I've been a few months disconnected from it now, I realized that we weren't. <laughs> yeah. You know, there were times that we weren't safe. Um, but again, we were in the care of phenomenal locals yeah. who did absolutely everything to make sure that we were taken mm -hmm. care of. Um, I mean, even in thinking about that, there were, there were trips that we were trying to get out mm -hmm. and the local goes, I don't think that's safe for you guys to go. So we didn't do it because right. he's like, I just don't think you should do Today's it. Today's not the day. Today's not the day. I've seen these reports I, mm -hmm. from my intel that you guys shouldn't go. And so we didn't go because we, we trusted what the locals told mm -hmm. us and. And, uh, yeah. And again, it was really strange the way that everything came together yeah. because we had all these random splinter groups of people. You know, <laughs> we had this incredible team of mountain rescuers. They were so amazing. Like their whole life, they're superheroes anyway, oh, right? Yeah. They're like going into the mountains, rescuing skiers and hire mm -hmm. hikers and climbers. And so they're superheroes anyway. Mm -hmm. Um, but they had all put that to the side and like teams of them were coming in from all over the Alps, all over Europe, and they mm -hmm. were putting their job aside and they were evacuate. They were using ambulances to run medical care all over Ukraine. They were going into the biggest hotspots, the ugliest places. They were evacuating people from oh, yeah. hell. I mean, oh, yeah. Soldiers hell. didn't matter. People, I mean, soldiers, anybody who needed to be evacuated. Yeah, they were incredible, going Incredible, incredible team I, of people. It was amazing. So we had them giving us uh -huh. intel. And then I somehow got put into this group of military, military and ex-military, but they were private contractor hackers. <laughs> um, absolutely. I, I have no idea what they say. Like... Um, the words they were using to me made absolutely no sense, um, but they were there to say, hey, we heard this, hey, we heard that, um, and they would dumb it down for me so that I could understand, <laughs> yeah. and so that was amazing. Um, and then, of course, we had locals that were coming, you know, people who had armored their own cars, yeah, like had, were putting on, you know, bulletproof vests and helmets every day to run into the worst mm -hmm. of the worst and these were just teenage kids they yeah. were just ki anybody who could drive and was willing to go you know and so mm -hmm. we just had a lot of information coming at us from yeah. a lot of different areas and so we always felt like we were well taken care of yeah um yeah. but again if you ask me that now i can see times where it probably wasn't um but that's war, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah, you're you're in a war zone, so it's never really safe. All right, this one comes from Mark. He says, "I've heard a lot of different things, and I don't know what to believe. But is, in your opinion, is the Ukrainian government corrupt, or is Ukraine corrupt?" Yeah. Um. I feel like this question is probably more geared towards is Zelensky corrupt? And that is a more iffy question <laughs> because um, this area of the world is, is known for corruption. And when I say that, I mean when you go to register a vehicle, you're going to have to pay somebody $25 under the table or it's not going to happen. Um, when you go to, you know, you could pay off a cop if you get pulled over. You can, I mean, so it's that sort of level of corruption that is just inbred into everything in society looking at ukrainian history you know they really just busted out of the soviet union in about 1991 mm -hmm. um so you still have these factions you know you still have the west which is wants to be very european and it's a, and they have this you know kind of 
look down mindset on the east which is much more rural and much of the east you know is russian by heritage they're russian by genetics and they and they'll even tell you when they came out they're like we didn't really notice the difference like we went to the sovereign nation of ukraine but we still spoke russian we still mm -hmm. lived in a russian village we still you know so there's a lot of different factions that kind of work together and it's a shared culture and history and it's just it's long and it's icky um and beautiful at the same time but there's a lot of things that cause internal strife within ukraine mm -hmm. um but i wouldn't say it's any more corrupt than any other nation any other nation or government any yeah. other nation or government um that we've experienced yeah. i wouldn't say no and i wouldn't say it's the worst that we've experienced no. either not mm -hmm. not by any stretch of the imagination so <laughs> So this was one of the questions. Is he a puppet of the West? Well, and this is how I answered it originally, and this is still what I think. He's trying to integrate Ukraine into Western Europe, so he leans towards pleasing the West. Yes. He gets accused of this more because previous leaders have been former olig oligarchs and puppets of the East. So Ukraine is stuck in the middle of this battle where you're going to be trying to appease one side or the other. You either mm -hmm. trying to appease Russia and its former oligarchs that are still in your country, or you're going to try to appease the West and become more Western European. So Ukraine is a poor nation. Um, the poverty level is fairly high. And so there's always going to be this battle between one or the other. So is he a puppet of the West? Well, no, but he's trying to lean his country towards that because he thinks that's what's best for his country. Yeah. And so do most of the citizens there. Yeah. So, you know, politics are a dirty game. And I'm no politician, mm -hmm. so moving on. Um... Are you going back anytime soon? Katie and Ryan want to know. Uh, well, we didn't plan to be there in the first place. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> you know, and many of the places we've been in our life, we didn't plan to be. So we sort of live our life. We've been blessed enough to live it kind of just with open hands. Um, and... Whatever opportunity comes along, whatever the mm -hmm. Lord says you're going to do now, we hope that we'll always be open to doing that. Yeah. Um, we don't have any plans to go back. Right no. Now. But, I mean, if we got the call and we felt led to go to there, we'll, we'll go. I mean, Yeah. So, so yeah. we don't have any plans to. <laughs> no, we don't. Um, but... Just to be real with you, it is very ugly right now. Uh -huh. And even a lot of our contacts, pretty much anybody who has been able to get out has gotten out. Uh -huh. Not everyone, but a lot. Um, very recent bombings, even in the last few days in Kyiv, have elevated um, as the Russian army is defeated time and time again. In certain places, there are backlashes and attacks mm -hmm. against civilians and bombings of civilian quarters in Kyiv. Yeah. And, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Um, a lot of the aid has pulled back, if not out, um, from those areas. Not to say it won't go back in; it will. But yeah. you know, there that that's the other part of this is there's always elevations, there's always ebbs and flows. Mm -hmm. There was times when we charged in full ahead, and mm -hmm. there was times where we had to pull back for a day or two and like regroup in a safer place and charge again in a couple days. You know, so. That's kind of part of it, too. There's an ebb and flow to mm -hmm. that war pattern, you know, obviously if you're not on the front lines. So, um, it's yeah. kind of... So, we don't know. We don't know. Um, okay, this is probably the one that we get the most. <laughs> um, some sort of question like this is just like, oh, well, how is that? Or... Basically, what was it like to be in an active war zone? Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna read because this question it's, was asked. And and it's so hard to it's answer. It's hard to answer. And I, mm -hmm. this was from my personal kind of journal, and I wrote it out to our sponsors. When we decided to go, we went with a nonprofit organization, so we had some sponsors back home that sent money to help mm -hmm. keep us there and help support the mission and buy us, you know, buy food for the teams and all that kind of stuff. And so had a group of people back home that were kind of in this with us, um, 
anytime you go into something like this, you can't do it alone. Mm -hmm. It can't just be the feet on the ground. There's always a, an army of yeah. people behind from funders to prayers to people who are, you know, sending you messages every day to people who, there's always an army of people. Yeah. And we had our army, you know, so um, a really unexpected army, <laughs> but they kept us going. But um, so, yeah, this is just a little excerpt that I'm just going to read to you because I think it's the easiest way to answer it. And it's literally titled in my journal, War is Weird. Um, and it says, I only have one experience with war and therefore am certainly no expert. So take the following for what it is, just one person's thoughts. One of our jobs in Ukraine was to escort teams on a two-day journey from the nearest operating airport in Krakow, Poland to Kyiv. The journey would normally take anywhere near that amount of time, but the bureaucracy of war changes the timeline of pretty much everything. <laughs> Long border crossings, destroyed infrastructure, military checkpoints drastically increased the time and patience needed to traverse this Texas-sized country. <laughs> you remember the border we crossed that one day and the, the uh, soldier asked you if you had a gun? Yeah. <laughs> he's like, do you have a gun? Have a and gun? we're like, no. no. And he's like, oh. Uh. <laughs> so he goes, bummer. I was thinking, you're American, maybe you have a gun, maybe I could have it. <laughs> yeah. It's not that we got in trouble for having a gun, he just wanted he to just have He just wanted gun. to know if we had a gun, because he was going to ask if he could have it. Yeah. But yeah, anyway, side note. <laughs> um, so as we're making this journey, as... In the beginning, excitement filled the vans as we picked up a new team, and as and the anxiety rose as we crossed the first border. And as the anxiety of the border crossing was fading, the polished roads of Poland quickly transformed into the pothole-filled rural roads of western Ukraine. Small villages and farmland dotted with gold-domed rooftops of Eastern Orthodox churches glittering in the sun captured their attention for a bit of time. But inevitably, within an hour or so of the border crossing, the statement came, and I came to expect it, and it's one that I'll admit was my first thought as well. The actual words and sentence structure varied, but the realization was, consist was consistent. Hey, there are kids playing on that playground. Or, does anyone else think it's weird that everybody just seems to be going about life as usual? And I would chuckle from the front seat and listen in as each consecutive group processed this unusual scenario. And that's what I mean when I say war is weird. In some ways, it's nothing like what you expect. Sure, the hot zones are absolute hell on earth. But everything outside of that is business as usual. For those who have never walked a war-torn street, we only know what we see on TV or in photos. But what you don't see is everything around the destruction. You see the abhorrent photo of the decimated apartment building, and in your mind's eye, you envision that the entire city looks similar. What you would actually see if you switched to a wide-angle lens is that all the neighboring buildings still stand, perhaps minus a few windows. The citizens tarp them up, the nightly street sweepers clean up the glass, and military does a mine sweep, and then a day or two the coffee shop down the street resumes selling lattes. It's a strange phenomenon. <laughs> there was so much destruction, but in the same moment, life as usual. There are those that flee, those that stayed, those that hid, and those that fought. But everyone, no matter what group they fall in, continues. The air sirens ring out over the city, but most people ignore them and continue about their day. They are as normal as the sound of church bells at this point. The Ukrainians refuse to cower. They consider their continuance of daily life an act of defiance, a giant middle finger to their big eastern neighbors. The normally fractured Ukrainian society is united in one thing at least, survival. None of this is to downplay the atrocities happening on the front line. War is full of horror, and this war included. Many of these citizen soldiers have experienced unimaginable crimes against humanity. Many of them not for the first time. Unfortunately, Ukraine has suffered this fate a great many times, and the normalcy of it is both astonishing and immensely heartbreaking, especially in the elderly population. It doesn't take long to adopt this outlook either, even for an outsider, as each successive team would come in, the first night's air raids would send them barreling down the stairs to the safety of the showers on the lower floor, but by day two or three, the nightly occurrence just had them pulling their sleeping bags over their head with an irritated huff and a return to slumber. It is what it is. 
We were often asked by Ukrainians, are you not afraid to be here? And our answer was always a firm and resounding no. We honestly never felt unsafe. Sure, we didn't station ourselves on the front lines. And when we did go to the front lines, it was with a select few of trained people. We had proper armor, seasoned guides, an angelic host of guards. We had the luxury of mobility that frontline soldiers and low-income citizens don't have. I'm not taking that for granted for a second. Not for a second. We had things that the lowest income of locals don't have. So our experience of atrocity is nowhere near those who couldn't get out and weren't mm -hmm. mobile and didn't have the ability to run. Um, it's horror and immense stress for those in the moment. But after the smoke cleared, we saw fierce strength emerge. Now, please don't imagine the Ukrainians as some sort of robot army. They certainly are not. The society is varied as any. There are debilitating cases of PTSD that will take years to resolve. Some of them never will. Everyone deals with trauma differently based on situation, personality, faith, culture, and support, just like everywhere else. There are women who shuddered at the presence of a man being near them, babushkas who would only leave their room to grab food and then hurry back and hope they were unseen to the, solitude, to the safety of solitude. Um, but on the same hall, there were former teenagers who turned warriors and, you know, a mother who went from housewife to manager of a refugee center of 300 people and she's feeding and clothing and, mm -hmm. you know, um, and then I just go on to say that we're still processing and, um, you know, the stories that we tell, the good, bad, and the ugly, um, we're still working through them, too. So that's why it might not be so polished. <laughs> but sorry about that. That was long. But I don't know any other way to explain war other than to say it's not what you think and yeah. it is what you think all in the same. It's, it's all the atrociousness, all the horrendous yeah. stories, all the just mind-blowing evil that you imagine. But in the same boat, you see the depth and the faith and the willpower of humanity mm -hmm. and just immense strength and coming together just as a human. Not as a Ukrainian, not as a man or a woman or a government official or a random nurse from Arkansas, but just as a human. Mm -hmm. And you see the best in people and the worst all in the same hour of every day, you know. Um, and so it's just one sort of mind-blowing episode <laughs> after another. And yet, in the moment, it's not mind-blowing because you don't have time to process any of that. You just have to get things done. Yeah. It's only later that you step back and go, oh, my God, that was, that was miraculous. Or mm -hmm. that was, how did, I help, how did I hold it together and not fall apart in that situation, you know. Um, and I think it's just the stress of the situation itself. It just keeps you going, and you don't think about it till later, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, all right. Let's see. What was your focus, Merrick? Merrick asked, "What was your focus when you were there?" Um, a lot of different things. <laughs> <laughs> Members and yeah. our first week, we you know a couple weeks we were there. A week, I guess. We were serving at the border. Just helping people get across the border, get their papers, get something warm to wear, something good to eat. And make their way to with a bus. Them, make their yeah. way to a bus to get farther. You know, that's kind of where we started. Um, and then we realized we weren't as much needed there. And so yeah. as, and, it, and it's important to say too that we had a different team coming every 10 days. Yeah. So, you know, some of our teams were stockpiled with medics and that kind of thing. Some of our teams were stockpiled with counselors. Um, some mm. of them were just workers, yeah. construction guys. Mm -hmm. and um, so we had a kind of a mix of of people coming and would try to alter what we were doing based on, who, you know, who and what we had in yeah. place. Um, and then several weeks after that, we were serving in a refugee center, um, doing everything from teaching some classes because all of their students mm -hmm. are out of school to we set up a medical program. We had a lovely nurse practitioner come yeah. in and actually a couple of them. And they were able to set up a clinic in the building, get some meds pulled in from home. Um, we were 
uh, remodeling a kitchen yeah. to help feed mm-hmm. the refugees there. Yeah, um, got a kitchen remodeled. Had set, some contractors yeah, come in. Yeah, setting up rooms for other, you know, because it kept on influxing from yeah. people coming. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we spent a few weeks in that refugee center. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we were kind of running splinter teams on the outside of that, trying to get yeah. goods delivered to the front lines because we had stuff like... Um, IFAX, which is like emergency medical kits and some bulletproof vests and some things like that that were coming yeah. in from the states that we were trying to get to the front line. So we were kind of side job. Ryan would take the team to the refugee center, and then Oleg and I would side job work on trying to get this stuff through. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of it was just a lot of my job and Oleg's job was just getting it into the country, <laughs> period. Yeah. You know, so we were reaching contacts everywhere trying to get this stuff in and get it across the border and get it to a driver who could get it somewhere. And um, and then the last few weeks we moved to Kiev and again we were kind of separated. That's when um, a new another team leader came in from the States. Yeah. She was absolutely amazing. She actually became the deployment leader for the whole thing, and she, you know, did it with... She brought an organization that I could never do, and yeah. just a grace and a peace to the entire thing. She was... Shanae was just beautiful, awesome, wonderful. Um, and so she finished off, and we eventually turned everything over to her after, and... Yeah. Um, but the what, when we went to Kiev... Well, we were serving that surrounding area with, yeah. with some of the devastated villages with food and yeah. supplies, just... Okay, worked so, with a couple of local yeah. churches that were distributing food and so yeah. we would go out with them and distribute basic hygiene products stuff like that uh-huh. yeah 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 um so a lot of different things <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a lot of different things whatever basically whatever w- was pulled to us by the locals that were in yeah. our circle that they needed if we could do it then we did it here the uh, the last question katie asked what's the one memory that you will never forget oh yeah yeah <laughs> Do you want to go? There's first? a few. You know, that's there, that's there a hard is, question. Yeah, there's, there is several things that happen along the and way. And they pop up every day. Because like I said, when you're in it, you don't process yeah. it and you don't think about it. And it's not till you go back and go, oh, that happened. Uh-huh. Um, mm-hmm. So they're still coming like every day, I feel like. but Yeah. Um, you have? You want to talk? <laughs> I want to talk. Uh, yeah. Well, I eat M&M's. I'm still feel better. I'm still better on that one. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. You got your, your drink your coffee? Mm-hmm, over here. Mostly. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, my, I guess the, one of the biggest ones that I had was I was part of one of the splinter groups that left out of uh, Kiev to go pretty much to the Russian line, I mean, the Russian border. Uh, they needed supplies. We, we took some food supplies, but maybe it was the IFAX mm-hmm. and uh, body armor, stuff like that. And so we, we, we went there and... We, we took a few locals with us. It was just a small team, uh, me and another American and several of the locals. And we helped with the food truck. We unloaded that. And they just kind of had a building set up for people. Well, they asked me, because we had a van, if we could help to deliver the food stuff, which we didn't know. We didn't have a big plan when we got there. It was just we, we knew what we were taking. And then after that, so we go out and we stop at a gas station to gas up. Now gas was super limited in Ukraine, which was really hard to get. But we did have a few of the local people who could help get us get gas that we desperately needed. And while we were there, the mili- different Ukrainian military started to show up. And we had these solar Bibles mm-hmm. that were flashlights mm-hmm. uh, and charge ports so they can charge their phones. They can listen to the Bible audio or, and yeah. it's also a flashlight. So it's a multiple and it's all solar powered. It was, you know, a really cool little thing. And as these soldiers pulled in, I just started going up to random, go up to them. I would talk to them and get to pray with them and hand them their solar Bibles. And, and then they would go on and then the next group would come and we, and the guys that were with me were excited and I'd be in the van. Hey, come there's more people over here. Go talk to them. And I'd go talk to them and, and then after that, that's when it kind of got serious, though. After that, we drove farther, close or closer to the border, to this little border village that was being shelled, pretty much. Mm-hmm. Um, it was an active war zone, and we were delivering food. And I, and I faxed to the soldiers that were there, and <laughs> before we went, unfortunately, I was the only one who didn't have body armor. And I was, <laughs> Abby really loves that part. Um, 
And I kept on asking people, hey, do I need body armor? And they're like, you don't have it? I said, no. And they're like, oh, that's a problem. And uh, I was thinking they were going to solve the problem, but they never did solve the problem. And so there was supposed to be body armor. There was supposed to be body armor when I for put me. him on the van that morning. <laughs> and I never got it. And but anyways, yeah, it was kind of crazy. So that, that was a little nervous. But as we were going in and, and, and handing out food, people we'd pull up to this kind of neighborhood that's kind of crazy, and then people would come out and we would hand mm-hmm. food to them. They'd go back into their houses. Um and we were driving as about as fast as that little van would go. And <laughs> the guy who was the, my guide didn't speak English. So we would go flying down the road. He'd just be like, go faster. So I'm just, you know, as fast as I can. And then he would start slowing me down and point. And there would be a mortar shell that was blown up part of the, there's a big crater in the middle of the road. We'd have to go around it. And, and uh, once we got done handing out of the food, we started to go back and we got towards the end. They're like, well, do you want to make another mission? And, yes, we need to evacuate some people. And so then we started, he had a list of people and we started to drive around the neighborhoods um, and finding is mostly elderly that couldn't get out. Mm-hmm. Um, I think one, one man was a blind man mm-hmm. and then a couple and like three or four elderly ladies that just weren't very mobile. They, they yeah, were, they one were, lady was bedridden. Yeah. And we had to pretty much pick her up and carry her and put her in. And uh, yeah, we, we, we were able to get four or five out and drive them to a refugee center and get them away from the front lines. And the moment we got them into our van, they would break down just, I mean, because they knew at that point they're getting out of this craziness that's going on, the hell that they've been in. And I mean, and this was near Harkov, so this had been going on, you know, for yes. 10 weeks at this point. Yeah. Everyone who could have lived had left. Harkov was uh-huh. destroyed. I mean, it was... And So these people had been through absolute hell. They'd been oh, through yeah. hell. Um, yeah, and so that's something that will stick, stick for a while. Of just the gratitude, of course, and, and just the relief that you can see that was happening there, mm-hmm. that they finally could get out. And that we could get them to a, a safer area and move them away from that was, yeah, yeah. That's 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 well, that's something I'm probably not going to forget for a very long time. Yeah, and uh, then you know it's like in that same boat. You know, he comes home and he's telling me this that day because I didn't go with him. <laughs> yeah, and then another guy in our group had a different experience, and this is where this is where I say don't judge us if we giggle because. Uh-huh. We had some characters, <laughs> and one of our guys who was armored went with a soldier to deliver some food to this, yes. this little family that lived in a hut behind yep. enemy lines. There, there was an and active so tank shooting. There was tank shooting yeah. over them. And I didn't the field. go to that one. Abby was happy that I didn't go. With well, them. he was. He. I was in that group. He, yeah. But right. So they like we, splintered off. Yeah, we splintered off so he could go because I wasn't protected. So. So anyway, <laughs> he comes back and he's telling us, "I'm just sitting there and I'm delivering my food and I go to take a picture." and here comes the guy and he runs past me and then he says run American <laughs> <laughs> and he's like so I just turned around <laughs> yeah <laughs> and so anyway there was always a, l- a little bit of dark humor at uh-huh. the end of your day to like try to get you through the fact that someone was just shooting they asked who he, what's his name and he was jokingly told, told them him. Captain I'm Captain America. America. Just joking, just joking. And, and, and but and it was funny that they. Also, I mean, he told me his name eventually. But <laughs> run, America, run. Yeah, that, that was a good. That was a good one. So anyway, there was always some sort of relief, you know, whether yes. it was Our, from the, from the devastation. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, or your border crossing with our friend. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. So, every we had this crazy guy. He was a bus driver, local bus driver, and normally he runs a tourist company. Yeah. So, he's usually taking tourists all uh-huh. over the place and in Poland. Well, he agreed to take us across into Ukraine, and so he was one of the people, like, every week we used yes. him to bring in a new yeah. team, and he would make the second leg into Ukraine, and character, total yes. character. But he was, like, a smoozer. Every border guard that was a woman, but, he was like hitting on them, yes. um, but in like not in a dirty no, way. He was just, just really funny and yeah. flirty and just which, silly, which made the awkwardness and kind of the intense kind of you know, tra- you know getting across the border he and it made it. it made it e- re- more relaxing because yeah. the first time you're with him and your first time you're ever crossing a border into a war zone, sure. you're nervous and you don't know what's going. There's military everywhere. You're kind of mm-hmm. you're tense. 
He made you relax and, and not be... And he made be, them relax. He made them relax, so, it, yeah. And it was funny because <laughs> about the fifth or sixth time coming yeah. through, fifth or sixth team, he, a new, border guard comes out and they see the van and they start to, you know, ask all the questions and get all the pat and do all the military yeah. things. And he he pipes up and says something in Polish, like, you know who these people are, is this? And then I opened my door and she saw me and she was like, oh! you Americans hi <laughs> like uh, hi it's still us it's just us again um and so we got to where you know but he was just really yeah. but anyway so one day we're coming across the border we're towards coming, the very beginning we're yes. coming out of Ukraine out of which Ukraine. is worse it's harder to get out than yes. in so we're coming out yes. and it's really serious there was one border guard female who was really serious uh-huh. And he was always trying to break her, and she was like, she, she just it, wouldn't yeah. do it. She finally did, but um, this was the day he broke her. <laughs> so we go, we go, and she starts asking questions and asking for papers, and she says, where have you been? And he says, Ukraine. <laughs> She's like, what have you been doing? And he said, discoteca. <laughs> So we'd gone to her hometown. We were handing out food and um, just there was a few people that she wanted us to meet. And so she takes me and one other guy into this park um, to meet this woman who she described as a pastor's wife. And I, I didn't really know why we were meeting her except that she had a lot of connections and there were possibly some things that we could help with. And so this very put together, very beautiful, just you know, businesswoman comes out of the building into the park to meet me, and um, within just a second, I was physically holding her body up, and she's a bigger woman than me, and so, like, we get to the bench, and I set her down, and, like, she just lost it. I mean, she just lost it, and um, she said, you know, I don't know what to do. I'm just trying to hold this community together. And um, and she was doing all kinds of things. Oh, my gosh. They were running weapons to the front lines. Her husband was fighting. Her sons were in another country. They had sent their children away. Her husband's on the front line. She's alone in this town trying to, like, make it work. And she's taking care of refugees and organizing just everything. Amazing. And... Um, and I said, well, what, what's going on in your mind? You know, what, what happened? Because I could tell something happened. It wasn't just the stress of it all. It was something. And she said that they had received a, say shipment, but a bus of refugees the night before. And that um, there was a woman staying with her who a group of people staying with her who they had, you know, their, the Russians had come in and basically when they come in, everybody runs to their house, the tanks blow up, shoot through the streets and yes, they shoot civilians. Don't let the news tell you it doesn't happen because it happens all the time and they're like going through the street, burning things and shooting things and pulling out women, raping women, killing people. Um, mass destruction and um and then they kind of blow on through and everybody comes back out and assesses the situation and you know and um so the people she had just received they had they had come out of their shelters to assess what was going on and they they kept hearing a baby crying and um you have kids watching now's a good time to Send them away for a minute. Um, so they heard a baby crying and realized it was laying on a mother's chest. The mother was dead. And so they, of course, you know, rush over to get this baby and um, see if it's hurt or if it's if it's okay. And um, 
the two men that had run over the Russians had rigged a bomb between the baby and its mother's chest and so when they picked up the baby it exploded and killed them all. And this whole group of people had witnessed it. They had seen it. And she just, she just fell apart. She's like, I don't know. <coughs> I'm sorry. <sighs> it's okay. She's like, I don't know what to do with this. <laughs> and I said, none of us know what to do with this. Like, that is not mm. something that you know what to do with. Like, mm. there, there are no words, you know. Um... And I'll never forget her. Never. Because she was just a mom. You know, she was just a mom and a pastor's wife and, like, a secretary of the business. And here she was, like, her children in two different countries. She had two sons in two different countries. A husband who was on the front lines. And she j and she's just trying to prop up all the rest of these people. And I thought, oh, my God. Like, what's that that's incredible strength <laughs> you know um and then there's arnold schwarzenegger yeah. <laughs> um little happier story sort of so when we were in kiev we um there was a little village west of kiev i can't remember the name uh, of it I, now I but it had been time. absolutely destroyed yeah ryan was off running another mission that day but i'd taken a team and it mm. was we went to deliver food for the local church. They had a bus and we were just using it and um, taking us to deliver food around. And uh, we visit the first guy's house and it's just absolutely destroyed. He actually, his home was bombed twice on two separate occasions. Um, and he was just telling us the story of the, the town and the town actually the men of the village actually went out to the village square and fought off the russians themselves <laughs> like fought off the russian army with this like civil group of men who just stayed there till it was over you know um and saved their village or what was left of it um superheroes i'm telling you but we get to this it's actually our guide for the day. We had a guide with us because there were still active mines in the city. And so the military had done a sweep, but there were still areas that you couldn't go. And so we had a guide who was kind of leading us into where to, where to go, where not to go. And we went to visit his grandfather. And this little man, he had been his, I think he was 79. Um, <laughs> and when we asked us, we asked him what his name was. He told us Arnold Schwarzenegger. And, of course, our buddy told him his name was Captain America. So he said, ha, I am Arnold Schwarzenegger. Um, came to bring him food. We walked through the gate and noticed that a shell has hit his home. And so it had hit right in the backyard. It had blown up his, like, garage. and um, Not garage. Garage is the wrong word to use. That makes it sound too fancy. <laughs> it was just like an outhouse shed area where he kept things and um it had blown that all up it had shot shrapnel all the way through he took us into in the house to meet his wife who was visually traumatized she was um she said they had the little one room house and um you know there's kind of a couch and a bed in the living area and she was explaining that they were asleep and thank god they were because they were laying down when the shrapnel came in, it came in about chest high and went all the way around the room. So every piece of furniture, the walls, it all had shrapnel. You could tell she was, she was stressed. So we didn't stay in the house long. We, I said, come on everybody. And we, we got out cause she was just in a, but him, he was, we come through the gate and he's got this little wooden three-sided wagon. <laughs> that it pulls with a rope and a one broken wheel and he's got this shovel that looks like it's from 1940 the wood handle and like broken sort of end spade looking shovel and he's trying to clean up this massive pile of rocks and brick and uh, ceiling tiles and roof tiles and and I was like okay okay like we're halting the process. I sent two of my people to finish the rest of giving away the food and the rest of us, we stayed. It's like, we're going to clean this up. And so all of 
my people who were there, they knew how to handle that kind of situation. And so we, we started to tackle that. And um, as we're picking through these bricks, you know, he stops to tell us where the shells hit and he points out two places where they hit and he begins to tell us these stories. And then at one point he stops and he recites a sonnet about the moon that he remembered in English from when he was a little boy or that he learned at some point. And he sings us this song about the moon and, and then we load his bricks into his little wagon and he goes to play, he's sort of hunched over really thin little elderly man you know and he goes to pull his wagon around the side of the house and he turns and looks at me and he goes I'll be back <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> I was like that's awesome you're awesome because he had told us his name was Arnold Schwarzenegger so he's like I'll be okay. back. And we lost it. The whole team. We just lost it. We started laughing and giggling. And then we came back later and we're digging through this pile and there's glass and broken, you know. So we're like trying to pick through all of this stuff and we're trying to save stuff for him that he wants saved. And and then we got in trouble. And she's like, do not throw away my beautiful bricks. Can't you see? I have work to do. <laughs> and he points at the side of this dilapidated shop that has a giant mortar hole through the end of it. And I realized in that moment that this little man was going to clean up the entire yard. He was going to remortar and rebrick his shop, mm -hmm. and he was going to get it back to looking good. And then he was probably going to go inside and fix his wife's furniture. Because he, it, for him, you could tell he had lived a long, hard life, and this was just like one more drop in the can. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't going to get him down. It wasn't going to stop him from dancing. It wasn't going to stop him from reciting sonnets or. Did he sing to you guys? Uh, he too? sung us a song about the moon. <laughs> And I mean, and then as we go to leave, we all pile in the van and he asked the translator because his English was very, very broken. I mean, he spoke phenomenally for a 79 year old Ukrainian man, but, yeah. um, but it was broken. And so he asked, um, our translator how to say something. And then he comes to the door to us and says, you best first responders ever. <laughs> and he and he shuts the door, and we just all lost it. Like, there's not one of us that that little man doesn't own our heart, I don't think, because he just was everything. And it sounds funny, or it sounds sad. I don't know that, you know, we were there to help him, but he was everything that we needed yeah. <laughs> that day. You know, it was just like his vibrance and his strength and his just willingness to look it in the face and say, well, this is what it is. We keep going. You know, it was just like, oh, yeah, we keep going. Mm -hmm. We keep going. Okay. We can do it again tomorrow, you know. Um, so, yeah, he was just super awesome. Super awesome little man. The last one I can think of was uh, in another town west of Kiev. that um, it's another not-so-nice one. Um but, you know, part of what we would do when we were working in the refugee center was just sit and listen to people and let them tell their story because they needed to. Mm -hmm. And um, his family told us the story that they had they had actually been trapped for 13 days in their basement um, because when the Russians rolled into their village, um, they busted into their home. But one soldier came into this particular home first. He was a young man. And, um, and this is something that you should know as well is that, you know, there was a lot of corruption and a lot of lies told on both sides. Um, Russian soldiers were told <coughs> that they were going to liberate their own people, yeah. um, that these people wanted to be part of the Russian Federation. Um, and people in Eastern Russia were told that they were, they were coming to be liberated. And, and most of them didn't really care. A lot of them said they didn't care one way or the other. Like it, like I said earlier, there, there wasn't much difference to them, whether they lived under Russia or Ukraine, either way, because um, they were Russian by heritage and, you know, whatever. But not all, but a lot. And, um, and I remember a lady saying to me, we were told they were coming to help us. We were told they were bringing food. We were told they were 
you know, that we were going to be part of Russia again. And that she said, and then they started shooting our people in the street. She said, and it was only then that we realized that we'd been lied to. Um, but the same goes for the soldiers. And so this particular soldier that was, um, had come into this house, he ushered everyone to the basement told them, he said, I'm not going to tell my people that you're here. I'm going to tell them this house is empty. Close the door and don't come out. Don't come out. If you come out, they'll shoot you. Don't come out. And so this family had locked themselves, you know, into the basement and they were there for 13 days. Um, the brother-in-law had gone out to grab some milk or something from the store right before they came into the town. And so they knew he was out there. Um, and so that was just like trauma for them, you know, for 13 days. They knew he was out there. They didn't know if he was alive or what was going on. And, and then when um, they were able to surface, they had found out that he was dead. And then as they were going to bury him, they were, had to immediately evacuate. And so this family is just sitting telling the story. And the, out of all that happened to them and out of all that stress, the Their sole focus was that they couldn't bury him. You know, that they had to leave him. They just had to leave him out there. And they just, every time they would go talk about it, they would just break down because there's something so inherent in those small things in life that you should be able to bury your dead. Mm -hmm. You know, you should be able to celebrate birthdays mm -hmm. and you should be able to have your children living in the same town as you. And, and, and it was those stories all day, every day. And you just, you know, people separated from their parents, not knowing if their sons were alive, not knowing where their children were, not knowing where their spouses were, or if they were alive, or... Um, yeah. So you're cleaning wounds of shrapnels and these little babushkas who've taken a bullet wound or taken a shrapnel wound and all they can, you know, they're just breaking down for their son, their grandson, their mm -hmm. husband, because they don't know where they are. And it's horrible. And um, those things don't leave you. You know, that stuff doesn't, it doesn't leave you. But then you walk out of that babushka's room and four toddlers, four-year-olds run down, the, you know, the middle of the hallway bouncing their ball and you just go, life goes on. You know, like it's horrible, it's horrendous, but also life. Mm -hmm. And they get a cookie and they, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, it's a very strange, it was just a strange juxtaposition of, of things and um, incredible, incredible people so many incredible people um those that came before us those that came after us and i will say about our cry teams absolutely would not have made it without you guys yeah like we were sent the right team at the right moment yeah. every single every time, time mm -hmm. week after week after week and like we said, we've done a lot of missions and a lot of service stuff all over the world. And I have never worked with teams that were that in such a stressful situation. No one ever, as a team leader, you, you get problems. You just have problem children. You just do. Never. Not one time. Um, people that were just servant-hearted, skilled, selfless. People that paid our bills for us because they found out that I wasn't able to keep working during the time that I was there. It just wasn't possible. Um, two specific ladies I can think of that paid our bills. I mean, they, they wrote us checks to, to take care of us so that we could stay and mm -hmm. that we could keep going. Um, they didn't have to do that, my gosh, yeah. but they did. Um, you know, team members that gave us the most incredible special gifts. Mm -hmm. Like, we had this one incredible woman who, she was amazing. Yeah. Like, she had 
climbed Mount Everest and climbed like all the highest peaks in the yeah. I mean, she was just this incredible, incredible lady and she'd been carrying around this necklace that her dad gave her before he died for years and years mm-hmm. and she just as we were leaving she wrapped it around my neck and she said, It's been waiting for the perfect person, you know, here it is. And it's you and um So we were upheld. Yeah. Over and over and over again. By the perfect words of encouragement, amazing, amazing teams that gave us no problem, were willing mm-hmm. to do anything, go anywhere, yep. just, I mean, they were awesome. So, all of you cry guys, we love y'all a whole lot. You know we do. We love y'all. Um, every last one of you. Yeah. Every last one of you. Made our time a lot easier. Oh, man. Mm-hmm. Couldn't have done it. No. Couldn't have done it. Um... From the mountain rescue guys to school teacher that was like our third (laughs) or fourth man, you know. Uh Um, He did everything for us from make sure we were safe to helped us buy vehicles, helped us get things registered, helped us buy trailers, helped us find housing, made sure everyone was safe, ran us all over the country, lined up lawyers for us and Mm -hmm. food and just was the most solid logistical person we could have asked for he's a school teacher his wife and children had already left the country he was stuck there no no men over the age of was it 21 Uh, no 18 it was i think 18 18. no men over the age of 18 could leave the country so the men are all there and um He's not a fighter, he's not a warrior, he's a school teacher, right? So people are just doing like what they can do and he was amazing. He was a leader in the war effort and in, and he was the perfect man to have on our side because he did every every T was mm-hmm. crossed, every I was dotted, everything was done with perfection and again we just we wouldn't have made it without him. So you know who you are. We love you very much mm-hmm. um just can't even begin to name all of them yeah. just the runners the drivers the mm-hmm. incredible people and they're still there um a lot of them not a all lot of them, them are, but not, not all of them not all of them some have gotten out some have left um but the war rages on and mm-hmm. the catastrophes rage on yeah. and um, people are still fighting and they're still battling and they still need help. So if you, if it hits your heart that you want to help, find a place, you know, find a place to do it. Reach out to us. We can help you find someone. Um, if you, if you want to give directly to something, um, just let us know. Let us know in the comments or message us personally. We'll, we'll get you fixed up. You can find us Lost Among Locals on Instagram or Facebook. Um, you can message us here on YouTube and we'll get you hooked up with some people that we know. Um, so we're going to wrap it up. So if again, if you have any comments just or any more questions, drop them down below. Ready to go get some deep? I'm eating this. I'm gonna go get something else to eat. Something, something a little bit more substantial <laughs> than anything. <laughs> All right, we'll see you guys later. Ta da! I was already a very light packer. This, after this deployment, I will be living out of a fanny pack for the rest of my days. Hey, hey, Rose, we're selling more.